Uh, we're going to start off with some didactic slides talking about the uh, genetics of drug-induced QT prolongation and what to do in, in general, sort of what do we do when we have genomic information and we don't have, have guidelines to, to guide us in terms of how to uh, implement that into patient care. Some disclosures, uh, I have served as a consultant for a couple of companies uh, in the space in the past 12 months. None of these companies or relationships have any uh, direct or indirect uh, relationships to the content that's being presented today. So my objectives by the end of this presentation, uh, I hope that you'll be able to describe the pathophysiology of long QT syndrome, discuss potential causes of long QT syndrome, both congenital and drug-induced, and then describe the current state of evidence regarding genetic variants that, that can increase the risk for drug-induced QT prolongation. So let's uh, start off with some anatomy and physiology review, uh, go all the way back to your bachelor's degree. Uh, so let's, re let's recall how, uh, how our hearts work. Uh, and remember that uh, the, the contraction of the heart is based on uh, the cardiac action potential, and that's the, the electrochemical basis for, for how our hearts do their squeeze. Uh, so at breast, the cardiac myocyte will have a negative intracellular voltage around uh, negative 70 uh, millivolts. And as there are changes in the ion flow of sodium and potassium and calcium across the cardiac cell membrane, that's going to cause the, the intracellular voltage of the cell uh, to become positive, which is called a depolarization, uh, which then generates that ventricular contraction. Repolarization. Uh, so going back to that negative 70 uh, millivolts occurs through additional ion flow, which brings the cardiac cell back to that resting state so that it's ready to fire again and squeeze again uh, when it's time. So the whole process of depolarization and repolarization are the result of a very complicated balance of calcium, sodium, and potassium ion channels, some flowing into the cell, some flowing out of the cell in various stages of the uh, cardiac action potential process. And so any dysfunction in these different ion channels, and there's a schematic of it on the right-hand side there, can result in arrhythmias. One of the most common arrhythmias that we see is uh, conditioned in as QT prolongation. The QT prolongation is an elongation of the interval between the Q and the T wave. You can see that up on the top right-hand uh, uh, graphic there. Uh, which results essentially in a delayed repolarization of the cell. So you get this longer repolarization uh, cycle. And if it's too long, what can happen is that uh, the cell, uh, the signal uh, that the cell receives to depolarize will come before uh, that cell is fully repolarized again. And so it's depolarizing before it's gotten all the way back to its resting state. And what can happen then is, is it just starts to degenerate, that, that rhythm degenerates, and can turn into uh, potentially fatal poly polymorphic ventricular arrhythmia known as torsade point. Now, the definition of what is considered to be kind of a too long QT, QT uh, interval or QT prolongation is a little controversial. Um, there's, there's different definitions of what, what too long means, um, but the commonly cited definition is 450 milliseconds in males and 460 milliseconds in females. Uh, however, there's pretty uh, good agreement that a QT interval of around 500 milliseconds is considered to be sort of an extreme QT prolongation, and that's where we're really starting to get into a, a greater degree of risk for uh, something like a torsade point to happen. So let's talk about some causes of, of QT prolongation. Uh, they can occur to, uh, as a result of both genetic as well as acquired causes. So let's talk about acquired causes, and let's talk specifically about drug-induced QT prolongation or drug-induced long QT syndrome. And this can occur primarily when drugs are inhibiting phase three potassium ion channels. So you can look over here on the side, uh, all of the IK channels there uh, on the right-hand side there are potassium channels. Uh, and those are... are um, uh, those are efflux uh, channels, so they are pumping potassium out of the cell. Um, one of the big ones here is the KV11.1, and that's the one that I've got a, a red box around there. Uh, that particular channel is highly susceptible to drug inhibition. It's got a very large pocket, uh, and so it's very easy for, for drugs to, to get in there and uh, kind of wreak havoc, if you will, 
um, although there are other proteins that have been impl implicated. Uh, however, this is kind of the big one for drug-induced QT prolongation is this KV11 channel. Uh, if you're not familiar with it already, I highly recommend that you go and check out the Credible Meds resource. The Credible Meds is an online resource uh, that is uh, supported by the University of Arizona. Uh, and it is uh, kind of the, the go-to resource for cataloging medications that have a known risk of QT prolongation. Uh, they've got a whole list of drugs in there, uh, and they sort of label them as known QT risk, uh, possible QT uh, risk, and then sort of, you know, theoretical QT risk. And currently in the United States, there are 41 drugs that are on the market that uh, Credible Meds has classified into their, their highest tier, which is that known risk of QT prolongation. And when we look at the list of drugs, it, there's a lot of familiar faces here. We see a lot of our antibiotics, fluoroquinolones, macrolides. We see many of our antidepressants like citalopram and escitalopram, haloperidol, and a number of our other antipsychotics uh, are, are represented in this, cast, in this, in this class. Some of our commonly used uh, anesthetics like propofol or some of our inhaled anesthetics uh, can cause QT prolongation. And of course, our antiarrhythmics uh, both uh, are, are sort of that, that weird class of drugs that can both treat arrhythmias but also cause arrhythmias. So amiodarone and sodalol, for example, uh, are known, uh, known offenders in terms of QT prolongation. And then there's a whole, a whole lot of other medications that don't kind of really fit into one of those categories, but are commonly seen, fluconazole, hydroxychloroquine. This was the big concern during COVID with the increased use of hydroxychloroquine is, are we going to be giving this to a bunch of people and causing drug-induced QT prolongation on Densitron and oxaliplatin as one of our chemotherapy agents? Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about congenital QT prolongation. So congenital QT prolongation is the result of genetic variants in genes that are encoding these different cardiac ion channels. Most of these conditions are very rare, uh, but they are inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. So all you need is one variant in order to be symptomatic. Uh, the big ones that, that we talk about uh, are, there's, there's essentially three, three genes that have been uh, identified as definitive causes of congenital long QT syndrome. KCNQ and KCNH2 uh, are both genes that encode subunits in the IKR and IKS channels. So those two that I have red boxes around. Uh, and those are definitive causes of congenital long QT syndrome. SCN5A uh, is a sodium channel subunit and also has been associated with long QT syndrome. And there's a number of other subunits that are in these different channels. Um, KCN1, KCN2, KCNJ2. All of these are known to be polymorphic, although none of them, at least to date, have risen to the level of being a definitive cause for congenital long QT syndrome. There's a number of other risk factors, both demographic and, and clinical risk factors for QT syndrome, long QT syndrome. Uh, the biggest one is female sex. So 55 to 70 percent of people with drug-induced long QT syndrome are female. Uh, advanced age, as we age, our, our, we're at more risk for QT prolongation. Structural heart disease, heart failure, MI, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, all of these things are a uh, risk factor for LQTS. Hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and bradycardia uh, are, uh, are added to the list as, as risk factors for long QT syndrome. Now, given that only some individuals will experience prolonged QT with a, uh, a QT prolonging med, uh, we've commonly thought that, oh, there's got to be some sort of genetic predisposition uh, that's sort of, in, you know, causing this. Not everybody who goes on citalopram is going to have QT prolongation, but there is some subset of the population, and might it be that there are gene genetic factors that are at play here? However, when we look at the genetic variants that are uh, known within those sort of definitive genes like KCNH2 and, and SCN5A, they only account for, for less than 20% of drug-induced long QT uh, cases. So it, it's a good chunk, but there's 80% that's left unexplained. So might there be other variants at play? Uh, there was a phenomenal review that was done uh, by uh, Lopez Medina et al. at the University of Michigan, uh, and they conducted a systematic review of genes that are associated with drug-induced QT prolongation. They wanted to kind of take a look and figure out what, where are we at in terms of the literature. And uh, they did something, something a little bit unique. They sort of used the semi-quantitative system to grade the level of evidence based on a combination of, of experimental evidence, 
clinical evidence and independent uh, replication. And so they looked and, and depending on the number of studies and the quality of those studies and whether they were in vitro versus in vivo versus case reports versus you know, larger um, studies with a, with a better study design, uh, they got various levels of points. And so you sort of added up the points uh, based on those different, uh, different studies and uh, uh, sort, of, sort of added up and, and kind of plucked it into these different groups. So if you had a score greater than 14, that was considered uh, to be definitive evidence uh, 11 to 13 was strong, 7 to 10 moderate, and then less than 6 was limited evidence. And the only variant that came back with a definitive ranking was a particular variant in KCNE1. So KCNE1 uh, is in that IKR channel, uh, and uh, the SNP is RS1805128, uh, and it actually encodes a non-synonymous uh, spartate to uh, Aspar asparagine, yeah, Sparte to asparagine. I had to think about my my uh, my letters here for a second. It's an Sparte to asparagine polymorphism, and uh, so it is non-synonymous. And in silico, prediction models do suggest that this is likely to be a deleterious mutation that's going to uh, impact the function of this protein. So that KCNE1 uh, gene encodes a subunit that's in that 7.1 channel there. And it's actually pretty darn common in the population. In East Asians, uh, it's up to 3% uh, will be carriers. Uh, in Europeans, we're talking about 1%, a little over 1%, a little bit less common in African and Latino populations. When we look at what, uh, what the authors found in terms of the evidence for this gene and, and uh, evidence that's been published since, uh, there's particularly one, one particularly good study that was a candidate gene study uh, by Cobb et al. Uh, that enrolled 176 individuals and found that in their population, which was a retrospective study, uh, it was associated with a ninefold increase in drug-induced QT prolongation. There's another study that was a whole exome sequencing study uh, that looked at 65 individuals with drug-induced long QT syndrome uh, versus 148 individuals who were exposed, who were exposed to the same drugs but did not develop drug-induced long QT syndrome. And this was one of their top hits in that whole exome sequencing study. They had then rec replicated that in another sample of 515 ethnically matched controls, and, uh, and it did replicate. A couple of interesting case, case reports uh, that have been published as well. Marsh ran et al. in 2018 reported on a patient who experienced dorsal, experienced dorsal point on citalopram and ended up being a carrier for the D85N polymorphism. And there were two additional candidate gene studies and two additional case reports that have also been published, uh, that all of which support a role for KCNE1 uh, D85N in drug-induced long QT syndrome. In addition to the in vivo data, uh, the experimental evidence and in vitro studies also appears to support an effect of this polymorphism on cardiac cell function, uh, and specifically uh, in terms of uh, the, the flow of potassium into and out of the cell. However, no clinical guidelines have discussed genetic predictors of drug-induced QT prolongation. There are no FDA labels that mention KCNE1, uh, and there are no, uh, it's not listed on the CPIC gene list as a, as a gene of interest, and PharmGKB currently lists it as a level three evidence. So to summarize, uh, long QT syndrome is a potentially fatal condition with both genetic and environmental etiologies. There's been a number of variants that have been associated with an increased risk of drug-induced QT prolongation, the best of which is this RS1805128, this D85N polymorphism in the casing anyone gene. Uh, it's been identified in whole exome studies, candidate gene studies, clinical case reports, and supported by in vitro evidence. Uh, so there seems to be some, some evidence for this out in the literature. However, we're at a point here where there's no clinical guidelines that have really uh, taken a hard look at this evidence and made any sort of definitive statements for how we can use this in clinical practice.